heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 294, covering the week of January 24th through January 28th, 2022. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, like our Gab page, and subscribe to our YouTube page. YouTube page is a great resource. You get our podcasts, all of our Abbeville U videos, all of our previous lectures, and it's all free of charge. You can find all those social media accounts on our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. That's A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, institute.org. While you're there, give us an email address. We'll give you a free ebook. Exploring the Southern Tradition, it's a great free resource, and you get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday when you sign up. The email, addre- uh, email address is invaluable because this is how we contact you. So if we have anything coming up like our Zoom webinars, which we had this week on the 14th Amendment, you're going to find out that way. It's how we keep in contact. So that email address is essential in our current climate. Also, you can support the Institute. If you like our podcast, our Abbeville U videos, our lectures, our webinars, our website, if you like all of those things, just simply click on that donate button at abbevilleinstitute.org. You can throw a few pennies our way. You can donate monthly, annually, or a one-time gift. It's all tax deductible to the full extent of the law. You can also click on the shop tab at abbevilleinstitute.org. You can get our logo and all kinds of great stuff, high-quality embroidered material. So you can get golf shirts, hats, t-shirts, golf towels, fleece jackets, all kinds of great stuff with the logo on it. And of course, that helps support the Institute and it advertises the Institute as well. And as always, if you like all this stuff, please let your friends know about it. We no longer have a Facebook presence, but we you can share our material on Facebook. So if you're on Facebook and you want to share it over there, please do so. That'll help drive people to our website and of course, get more people interested in what we do. And rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast. So it's on Spotify. Uh, it is on Apple Podcasts, so make sure you do that. Also, download the, download the free Abbeville Institute app. It's on our webpage as well. You can get the Abbeville Institute on the go. Make Abbeville Institute your Amazon Smile preferred charity. So that's a way you can donate without really doing anything. It's painless. If you buy something at Amazon, we get some pennies out of that. So all kinds of ways to support the Institute, and we appreciate all that you do for us. Now, let's talk about the material for the week. And we had a lot of interesting material this week. I think we always do. First, let me just recap that Zoom webinar. It took place January 27th. We had a great uh, legal scholar, Jesse Merriam, at Patrick Henry College. And we talked about the 14th Amendment. And it was the highest attended uh, webinar we've had. Now, we do have the opportunity to get more than 100 people. So that's one of the reasons why. But we had a lot of people at this webinar. And these things aren't expensive, of course. If you want to catch any of the replays, if you missed it, you can go to abbevilleacademy.org, abbevilleacademy.org. You can, you can purchase these webinars. They're $15 there, and you can get them. So if you want to catch up on them, you want to get some of the ones you missed, it's a great opportunity to do so. But this was a fantastic webinar, and we got into all the intricacies of the 14th Amendment. Uh, was it legally ratified? Was it not re- legally ratified? Uh, what, what about incorporation? What was original intent? and how have things happened. So this is a really great webinar. And all of these things are there for you to try to educate yourself and then educate your friends. So please go out and get these things. When we have these webinars, we do them once a month. It's a great opportunity for you to learn something. Even if you know it, maybe you're going to learn something you don't know. And of course, introduce you to many of the Abbeville Institute scholars that we have. So that was this week. We've also had some really good articles this week. So the Institute is always doing something. And of course, the website is a way that we can reach you through the written word. And one of the pieces we had, and I want to start with it, is Ryan Walters, who's one of our Abbeville Institute scholars. He's written a really great book on Grover Cleveland. He also has a new book out on Warren Harding. Um, And he wrote a book last year on Apollo 1. So he's, he's producing a lot of work right, a lot of material right now. So Go out and grab that book. If you go to the if you go to the website and you click on that Grover Cleveland article, it's a, it's a chapter from the book. There's a link to the book there. So you want to get that. It's published by Shotwell Press. Or actually, I'm sorry. It's published by Abbeville Institute Press, I believe. So uh, you want to get that. Uh, you want to get that book and uh, go ahead and, and, and read it. I mean, look, Grover Cleveland is an important part of this reconciliation process. And that's what I want to talk about today 
is reconciliation because reconciliation is the key to understanding the post-war period. If you believe the righteous cause myth people, then there was reconciliation was a bad idea. But you see, the righteous cause myth was a very small percentage of the American population after the war was over. In fact, most Americans wanted to get wanted to resume the Union, get back to business as usual. They wanted the Union back together. They wanted it put back together the way it was before the war, absent slavery, and simply get back to normal. And you see this. This is human nature, right? So look at what's happening with you know the, the situation with COVID. There are a lot of people out there that uh, that have you know these these ideas on what they want to do with lockdowns or mandates or all these other things, and then you have people that just want to get back to normal. And most of the American population is the people that just want to get back to normal, and they want to tell the the political Puritans to stick it. And essentially, that's what was happening in the Reconstruction period. You had the political Puritans who wanted to enforce all of these things, heavy-handed policies. They wanted to remake America. They wanted to revolutionize America. And most Americans said, "Yeah, no thanks. Just stick it." And so that's the part of, of, uh, of the post-war period that a lot of activist historians now don't like. And essentially, that's what we're looking at. What we have are activists, not historians. And I say activist historians, and I, historians is a loose term for these people. They're political activists. And what they want to do is ensure that their version of the story is the same. You see, the information hasn't changed. All the information is out there. And, and in fact, if you go back and read these old sources on Reconstruction, even the quote-unquote Dunning School doesn't hide the material. What happened is you have different interpretations of this material now. So the activist historians go back and look at it, and they come up with all these nefarious reasons why people were doing things. The Southerners were lying. They were just uh, trying to do all these things clandestinely, and they, were just, they just wanted to abuse people and persecute people and suppress people and all these things. That's what it was all about from the beginning. So they subscribe all these, uh, I'm sorry, ascribe all these, uh, these nefarious reasons to why his, his Southerners were doing different things, particularly with Confederate monuments. And there's no evidence of it. That's the real tragedy about this. They're making this stuff up. It's like uh, they're, they're putting Southerners on the, on the couch and saying, well, tell me exactly why you did this. It's psychobabble. It's absurd history. It's Fawn Brody all over again. Well, tell me why you all really wanted to do this. You had some type of uh, you know, deep-seated emotional and uh, a reason for doing these things. So this is why you did it. It's Fawn Brody's uh, psychoanalysis nonsense. It's exactly what it is. And essentially, that's become history, which it really isn't. So when you look at Reconstruction and Reconciliation. Grover Cleveland is an important part of the story because Grover Cleveland was the first Democrat elected president since James Buchanan in 1856. When he's elected in 1884, he is the first Democrat elected. And of course, Cleveland's from New York and Grover Cleveland was known for cleaning up corruption. Americans looked at the Republican Party that had occupied the executive mansion, had controlled the United States government since 1861, as extremely corrupt, whether it was the Grant administration, which frankly was very corrupt, and everyone knew it, which is why the Republicans really lost in 1876, but only through fraud were they able to stay in power. Whether, uh, you know, you take your pick of, of the administrations, the, uh, I mean, look, the Garfield administration, leading into the Arthur administration, very corrupt. I mean, Garfield was assassinated. The Hayes administration, very corrupt. These were corrupt administrations. You had all these Republicans in power, abusing power, and people were tired of it, which is why they elected Grover Cleveland. In fact, Cleveland lost in 1888 through corruption. So we have this extremely corrupt period of time in the late 19th century, and Cleveland was seen to be a reprieve from this corruption. In fact, that's what he was known for. When he was governor of New York, he came into power, came into office, and he pledged to clean up corruption. And Southerners admired Grover Cleveland. He was a conservative Democrat, and he promised to heal the wounds of Reconstruction. Well, how was he going to do that? He appointed Southerners to various positions or people sympathetic with the South. 
he tried to get confiscated Confederate flags back to the South, even though uh, that didn't work out at the time. Uh, that would later be Teddy Roosevelt was able to pull it off. But still, Cleveland was trying. Uh, he appointed Southerners to the Supreme Court. I mean, Cleveland was looking at the United States as a real nation at this point, whereas Republicans were looking at it as a sectional government. It's exa- I mean, this is what people miss about the Democrats. Even in the pre-war, the antebellum period, they missed that the Democrats were the real national party. The Republicans were not. They were a sectional party. They had no support anywhere outside of the North. This is something that people don't get. And when we get comments like, well, the, 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 uh, the uh, Southerners were just upset. They, they, uh, democracy prevailed and they didn't like democracy. But Lincoln wasn't really the majority president. In fact, the majority of the American population did not want Lincoln. Yes, he won the Electoral College. But this is something the left complains about. We'll say Donald Trump. Well, he never got a popular vote. He never got the popular vote. He only got the Electoral College. And everyone understands the Electoral College is how you elect the presidents, right? So, so the enough states wanted Lincoln to be president. But was there something else going on here? Would Lincoln have won all these northern states had there not been a split in the Democrat Party? Had there not been all of this chaos? Would he have won all of these northern states? If you look at the numbers, it still looks like, yes, he would have won those states. But perhaps if there hadn't been so much chaos, he doesn't win all of those states. We don't know, because it worked out the way it did. But we know he wasn't even on the ballot in southern states, right? So Lincoln didn't get but 39.6% of the popular vote in 1860. 60% of the American public did not want him as president. So he wasn't really a majority president. He's a sectional president, representing a, a minority of the American population. A minority of the American population. A vast minority of the American population. So when you look at Cleveland and you look at the Democrats, they were the true national party. They represented both sections. They represented all the people in, 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 in across the United States in terms of you know, uh, people in the North, people in the South, people in the Midwest, people in the West. They had supporters everywhere, whereas the Republicans did not. Even after the war, if the Republicans hadn't engaged in disfranchising people, they would have lost in the South by crushing majorities. Yes, they would have had support there. But by crushing majorities, they would have lost. And anywhere after the war, when elections start happening and they're not as corrupt, Democrats start taking back power. Because again, they were the real majority party. They were the truly national party. So when Cleveland comes in, he tries to fulfill that part of the Democrat party and be a truly national president to represent all the sections and all the people. I mean, Cleveland went to one of the most important uh, unveiling ceremonies of a Confederate monument during his administration there in Chicago, Illinois. And, I mean, this monument was important because this is one that represented uh, the lost souls at Camp Douglas. And that was a real extermination camp in a lot of ways for Confederate prisoners of war. I mean, people were purposely starved, denied warm clothing in the winters, I mean, this was a horrible situation. So Cleveland recognizes, showed up, and was there at the at the dedication ceremony, which was also attended by both uh, people from you know former Union officers and former Confederate officers. So you had a real reconciliation process that was important. But you see, modern historians don't like this, and so this particular series of articles will run one next week too out of this chapter by Ryan Walters talks about Cleveland in the South. And how Southerners admired Cleveland for some of the things he was trying to do to bring them back together into the fold. Now, William McKinley, who would succeed Cleveland as president in 1897, is seen as kind of the final bridge to that. McKinley had a Southern strategy. McKinley was ensuring that uh, the Republican Party would not be as abusive towards the South. He toured the South. And Southerners generally like William McKinley, even though not all, I mean, he, he did get some votes there. Uh, but they, they didn't necessarily dislike McKinley. And then you get the Spanish-American War, and Southerners saw this as an opportunity to be part of the United States again in the 1890s, to be accepted back into the United States as being pariahs, so to speak, in, in American history. And that was going to be the case then. Up until really the 1960s, you had a reconciliation message. And 
essentially uh, after the centennial is when you start seeing some things change because you had activists on the left who didn't like the centennial. They didn't like the fact that Southerners were, uh, were getting to t- still talk about how they viewed the war and it was all wrong. They couldn't have that. And of course, even before this in World War II, you started having a reckoning with this. Uh, you know, many Northerners, you know, the Kenneth Stamp kind of people were out there saying, oh, these, these, uh, these Southerners are just all wrong. They're just telling fairy tales and this is the lost cause. And now that's just been amplified in the last, say, uh, 30 years, since the 1990s by a bunch of activists who are masquerading as historians. So this this piece is important because it bridges into everything else we did this week, and it shows you how far the historical profession and American culture has been depraved. So you look at the piece, if you think about reconciliation, these beautiful monuments being built in the South and in the North, not just to Confederate soldiers, but to Union soldiers. I mean, this is a period of monument building. People were thinking about the war, They were thinking about what it meant. They were thinking about what it meant for the United States, for the American public, thinking about what it meant for American culture, all of these things. And they're building these beautiful monuments all throughout the United States. No one talks about, and we have on this program, but no one talks about, at the same time all these Confederate monuments being built, you had a lot of Northern monuments being built too, Union monuments. Same time. Same thing. But uh, in the South, they were just trying to tell a different story, whereas these Union monuments... Very few of them even mention slavery either. Some of them do, but very few do. So where is the disconnect here? Why can't people get this? Well, because supposedly it was just the South were a bunch of racists. Well, we know that they were racists in the South, but there were racists in the North too. It wasn't like the North was the happy land of non-racists and the South is the only place you had racists. And we pointed this out on uh, on the Abbeville Institute website and on this podcast as well. So this is not something that was uh, unique to the South. So when you look at the, the piece on Monday by Larry Bean, who was a minister and a, a um, Lutheran priest in, in uh, Louisiana, the title of the piece is A Tale of Two Statues. And it's a short little piece, so I want to read this one because this shows you what's happening here. He says, When Robert E. Lee died in 1870, Memorial Association was formed in the city of New Orleans. After six years had passed, the association raised an amazing $36,400 during the throes of Reconstruction to construct a monument. The world-famous New York-based sculptor Alexander Doyle was commissioned, and it was installed at uh, Tivoli Circle, renamed Lee Circle, in 1884. The statue was placed atop a granite pedestal consisting of a 60-foot column. The statue itself is 16 and a half feet high and made of bronze. Attendees at the dedication included Jefferson Davis, two daughters of General Lee, and former General P.G.T. Beauregard. So think about that. $36,000 raised for a a monument. It took them six years to raise enough money to do it, and they commissioned a world-famous artist, Alexander Doyle, to go and and, and sculpt this monument. 16 and a half, so it's a 76, almost 77-foot high monument. And the people that attended, Davis, two of Lee's daughters, and Beauregard. Now, one of the things I want to emphasize about this period of time also is the sadness. And Southerners were were very sad, and they were looking to be brought back in the Union. This is reconciliation, okay? And they were looking for a way to ensure that the greatness of their civilization would not be simply run over by these righteous cause mythologists. They were concerned about that. There's nothing, there's no hiding the fact that that was the case. You have people like um, Karen Cox. Oh, well, this is new. Nobody knew that these people were, were trying to ensure that their, that their civilization would be uh, at least preserved. And look at how nefarious this is. Well, why would you expect otherwise? They're just going to say, well, we all stunk, right? Our, our civilization had nothing to offer. Our people had nothing to offer. We were just awful traitors. That's what we were. This is essentially what I think these people want Southerners to say. So Bean continues, Monuments such as these also memorialize the many common soldiers whose bodies were never recovered for burial or who lie strewn across battlefields in unknown, unmarked, or even mass graves. 
The post-war monuments provided solace for survivors and healing between the regions as monuments to dead to the dead of both sides in the war were erected as the veterans were dying off. The Lee statue was a rare early monument er erected during the post-war federal occupation of Louisiana. In time, Lee Circle and the monument became an important landmark and meeting point for locals, especially for Mardi Gras parades. The circle stands at basically the intersection of the Garden District, the French Quarter, and the Central Business District. The statue became iconic to the city, uh, to the city landscape. The monument made the National Register in 1991, and in 2011, New Orleans Magazine declared it one of the most important statues in the city, along with another striking Doyle piece, the equestrian statue of P.G.T. Beauregard. So, 1991, it's a National Register, it's on the National Register of Historic Landmarks, right? So, in the 1990s, these things were added as historic landmarks. And the city of New Orleans, 20 years later, says this is a really important monument. So what happened within a decade? Well, everyone went woke. And we had activists masquerading as historians and a bunch of rabble-rousers decided that these things were showing oppression. Six, or six years later, after 133 years, the monument was declared racist and removed, being placed in a shed in a city junkyard where it remains, along with three other historical monuments, including Doyle's Beauregard, hidden to this day. The column remains in place with nothing on it. On January 22nd, 2022, a new statue was erected at the, at the ground level of the pedestal where it remained for several months. It was executed by another New York sculptor named Simone Lee. The statue is titled Sentinel. And it takes the diversity of African cultures in New Orleans as a starting point, evoking African folklore and spiritualities. The statue is supposedly of an African idol, described as a water spirit or deity. The deity is sometimes associated with lust and prostitution. This representation is a nude female uh, from uh, form wrapped by a snake with a unique and unusual element of having a head shaped like a spoon. Yes, a spoon. So I, we don't have a picture of this. It is the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen in your life. It is just stupid. So you go from a sculpture, a, a, from a well-known international sculptor, right, Doyle, beautiful sculpture with a column, beautiful column, to this. You want to talk about a culture that's lost its way. A place that's lost its way is this. Quote, the ceremonial spoon from the sculpture references a symbol of status in Zulu culture, so honored in New Orleans, according to the exhibition. Lee's sculpture holds forms of knowledge that have been passed down through spiritual and masking traditions of the city and beyond, wherein ma uh, masking signifies, trans signifies I'm sorry, transformation, not simply concealment. Right, well, first of all, how do these people know that they're Zulu, right? Zulu is a African culture uh, that's more in line with uh, Central and South Africa than West Africa, where most of the people of African descent arrived in the United States. So it, it, it doesn't even make any sense. If it was West African, maybe. But it's, it's not really a group or a culture that has as much to do with West Africa as, as it does other parts of Africa. This is where people are just so confused. They don't even know, right? And we're going to have a piece next week about a, another side of this from one of, our, one of our scholars. She's presented many times, Barbara Marthel. Uh, and she talks about her, her attachment to New Orleans in Louisiana and how that's different, right? And now this is something else. So Bean continues, rather than located on the top of the 60-foot pedestal, it sits on the ground. It is claimed that this was intentional. Quote, not looming over people, but rather emerging from among us, the uh, exhibition statement said. This constellation dissenters whiteness and the legacies of colonialism, renewing access to knowledge and culture that has been suppressed by the falsehoods of white supremacy. Well, that's interesting because I don't know if New, if New Orleans or Louisiana ever... I mean, that, that particular city, in, I mean, if you just want to talk about New Orleans, never really suppressed African culture. I mean, 
what do you think jazz music is? <laughs> okay, uh, you know, blues, which came out of the Delta. What do you think these things are? It never really suppressed any of this. And you had a very large black slaveholding population in New Orleans. They controlled much of the city. So it wasn't really suppressed. This is just hogwash. Of course, that may be just a flower way of saying that they lack the know-how and the money to hoist it to the top of the six-story six column. At any rate, this is a fitting symbol of New Orleans, a crime-ridden, violent, impoverished, drug-infested, culturally debased, infrastructure-ruined, politically destroyed, and corrupted city, a shell of its former historical greatness. The naked woman with the head of a spoon is wrapped by a serpent, calling to mind Eve and the original sin of mankind, a primitive hot mess of a superstitious idol representing the decay of civilization, culture, art, history, and craftsmanship. This is a fitting display of public art that fits in with the city's other offerings, such as electrical boxes painted in what appears to be finger paint, often with depictions that look like stick figures or a large scrap heap of junk bicycles painted white and, and piled on one another, and murals that are indistinguishable from the seedy graffiti and rat-infested blight that dot the landscape where majestic statues once stood in manicured public spaces. And like most displays of inferior quality, modern art, people will stare at it, rub their chins and applaud like the townspeople in the emperor's new clothes, wanting not to appear, wanting not only to appear sophisticated, but in today's reality to prove their political correct bona fides by pretending that this somehow represents an improvement instead of decay. And this is 100% right. So we've gone from a point where we really had real reconciliation, where we celebrated Western civilization, the great heroes of Western civilization, and now we've gotten to this. It's decay. It's decay. We're losing Western civilization as we speak. And people are cheering it. It's sad. Of course, Cleveland represented the bridge between North and South and reconciliation and Western civilization. And when you look at what Casey Chalk wrote on Tuesday, Misdirected Outrage, how people can donate to the SCV through the federal government, and now there are people saying this is outrageous, and he points out there are only a few people that even do this. But yet, you can donate to all kinds of left-wing thing, left things, and uh, nobody blinks an eye at it. But one little I mean, group of people, I think he said in here, if I, if I go back and look at the article, uh, it's, it was uh, $4,000. 25 people in the federal government donated $4,000 to the SCV last year. 25 people. And this is what people are really upset about. 25 people. 25 people in the entire federal government took the time to donate to the SCV. And he says this is probably going to decline the next few years because of the fact that people are getting, people that would donate to the SCV are not really welcome, right, for, uh, for such things. And when you put all this together, and the piece on, on Thursday, Suffering Providence and Robert Louis Dabney, and you understand the suffering that Southerners went through. I mean, both in terms of physical suffering because of the war, the mental suffering, the emotional suffering. And then you look at Dabney and all the physical ailments, the loss of family members, all the things that he went through in the post-war period. You understand why Southerners wanted to keep their civilization alive, wanted to ensure that this was passed on. Dabney went through a tremendous amount of physical suffering himself, ailments. He had children that died. Uh, of course, his hero, Stonewall Jackson, was killed, wrote a great biography of Stonewall Jackson. And yet he kept faith that things would be okay. And I think that's key to understanding this idea of ensuring that by keeping these things alive, everything would eventually be okay. And what we're seeing now is that they were all right to begin with. If, we, if there wasn't an active effort to keep these things alive, the other side would grind it down and wear it down because they have supposedly the moral high ground. And as other Southerners have pointed out, this is a treasury of counterfeit virtue. They really don't have the moral high ground at all. But that's how it's seen. It's 
So this is why we do some of the things we do at the Institute, like Clyde Wilson's series on Southern poets and poems, because this is the real beauty of Southern civilization. Now, uh, the, the author he covered this week was Thomas Holly Chivers, who was uh, in some ways the poor man's Poe. He's very good friends with Edgar Allan Poe, and they actually had a debate over who was stealing from who, who was plagiarizing from who. And if you look at Chivers' uh, poems, they're very similar to Poe's. But was Poe stealing from Chivers or was Chivers stealing from Poe? Nobody really knows. But they had a falling out over that. They were good friends at one point and then had a falling out. Uh, Chivers is a, a eccentric individual. In fact, he was buried. The rumor is he was buried uh, under the steps of his house so, so that uh, it's thought that you know his wife wouldn't remarry. But uh, regardless, this part of of Southern civilization is, uh, it's the beauty of it. It's the flower of the civilization. And you know, the art, the literature, the music, that's the beauty. Of course, we can talk about the political ideas and uh, the attachment to the old Federal Republic, all of those things, which are also beautiful in their own way, and an attachment to the old Anglo-American traditions. Those are important things. But this is why we talk about exploring what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. We know there are things in the Southern tradition we would not want to recreate, but there are things that still offer a counterweight to American decay today, and that would be the statues that are coming down. That would be the Southern literature. That would be the music. That would be the art. That would be the, the ideas of decentralization. And small is beautiful, and agrarianism, and uh, you know, sleeping around your own back door and not being an imperialistic Puritan. These are things that we can offer from the South that would make America better. But yet, because they're painted with pejoratives which are not based on historical reality, but activism, they're done away with. And that's the sad thing about it. All right. Hope you enjoyed this week. Until next week, good day. Good day.